is a sausage dog. Hello, new friend. Yes. Yes, you poop in my flower beds. That's fine. A few weeks ago we had a little look at some Viking Age brooches, some of the more common styles you might see, some of the more common styles you might want to buy for a Viking reenactment impression. And this week we're going to look at some of the other types of jewellery that you might want to look at. And the main types that we're going to look at are rings, armlets and arm rings, torques and pendants. Those are sort of the main types of jewellery that you see a lot of people wearing. Those are the main types of jewellery that we tend to see when we excavate Viking Age sites. Whoops, that's been knocking my tripod there. And there are some others that we're going to briefly look at. People have been asking me to do a video about beads for ages. I am going to do a beads video. They're getting their own video because I want to take a proper deep look into how beads were made a thousand years ago. So that's not going to be a thing that we look at necessarily this time. We might mention beads, but beads get their own show. It's hot in Scotland right now, but I'm sweating. Absolutely sweating. Look at me. Like a Tory without a trust fund. Let's start by looking at rings. Everybody loves a ring. A ring is a nice, easy gift to get a reenactor if you want to buy them something shiny. They're relatively simple in terms of their design and the way that they're made. But in the Viking Age, and before the Viking Age, right back into uh, the Mycenaean period really, we get some fantastically detailed rings with carvings, rings that were intended to be used as seal matrices, and we do have very elaborately carved, elaborately decorated rings in the Viking Age, like this one. But the vast majority of rings that we see tend to be fairly simple pieces of silver or gold. And some of the designs that you see all over the internet in these big shops that sell Viking-inspired jewellery, you know the ones I mean, uh, will be trash. And you can tell the ones that are trash because they just take a motif that says Viking to people and slap it onto a band. And that's not really how rings work in the period. The vast majority that we see are either a piece, a band of metal, or several bands of metal or wires intertwined or connected in some way. And those that do have motifs attached to them, like these ones here, are made in a slightly different way to the ones that are mass produced now. So the majority of the rings that we get, um, and in particular, I'm talking about in the British Isles here, are either single bands or a few wires knotted like this or wrapped together like this. Uh, and then some of those that are kind of wrapped together are obviously heat treated and then hammered together at the end so that they become one solid, um, not, well, not a solid band, but one solid piece of metal instead of several strands. I should be saying strands, not bands. You see this type of ring all over the place. If I actually got one somewhere around here that I should really... Give me two seconds. Find this bloody thing. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Bloody put the buggering thing. Oh, testicles. 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 No, stop it. You stay there. Oh, it's there. I didn't put it anywhere. I didn't move it. It was where I found it. Oh, I'm gonna need you as well, aren't I? <laughs> Let go, you rotter. Don't punish me. I back. I back. I'm behind the chair. Shit! Yeah. Anyway, a bit like this. You can see on the inside, it's actually been hammered flat there. So this is what I'm talking about, is we've got these two strands that are twined together to make the single band of the ring. Uh, and then they're hammered together at the ends. Uh, this is actually gold-plated because I was feeling very fancy at the time. Uh, it was a present. And it's actually been flattened on the inside, so it's a bit comfier to wear. You don't see that on some of the originals. Most of the originals actually don't have that as a feature. I don't wear that as my pinky ring. Uh, this is a modern one that I'm wearing on my other finger. Isn't it cool? It's badass, right? Um, 
so that's one style of, of ring that you see, is these kind of bands hammered together. You do see rings sort of in a, in a sort of seal matrix style. This one's based off a find uh, in Selkirk, up here. Am I holding the right way up? I am. Uh, and this is kind of more of a more of an Anglo-Saxon style animal motif on it, of this, this kind of birdie dog thing eating its own tail. <laughs> Delicious tail! Um, and this is just brass. And brass and copper alloy, bronze, are very common materials for jewellery in the Viking period. Um, so there's no shame at all in just buying the bronze version. And most websites where you can buy reenactment jewellery replicas uh, you'll get the option. You'll get the option to buy silver, or you'll get the option to buy a bronze, or sometimes even a gold-plated or gold version of the ring or the brooch or the pendant that you want to you want to buy. And <clears throat> it's absolutely period to be wearing bronze jewellery. Uh, it shines up nicely. It polishes up. It looks good. Brass jewellery it can look just as pretty as gold, uh, but it's sometimes you know a quarter, eighth of the price. So consider your options. Consider your Budget, just like we said in the other video about brooches, it's what you guys can afford. So, you know, always let your conscience be your guide. Or your wallet, in this case, I suppose, rather than conscience. Anywho, so we get all of these uh, lovely different types of finger ring, and they're not just made of metal. We do have some stone ones. We have rings made out of jet from near Whitby. We have uh, types of coal being used to make to make rings as well. So rings were being made out of an awful lot of stuff. Um, and yet you do have gold rings with jewels set in them. Most of the precious stones from this period, in fact I think all of the precious stones we see from this period that are uh, that are cut, that are polished, are cabochon polished or cabochon cut. And the what that means, a cabochon jewel is basically the nice rounded jewel. So it doesn't have all of those flat facets and faces like you'll get in a cartoon diamond. Uh, it is just a nice round, almost like a almost like a piece of beach glass type effect. And some of them are very highly polished and burnished to a beautiful mirror finish. Some of them aren't, some of them look a bit glassy. And uh, you do get glass instead of jewels. You do get things with glass beads and uh, sort of glass cabochons in them instead of real precious stones or semi-precious stones. And <clears throat> again, that is perfectly period. So if you find something that is, you know, bronze with a piece of glass in it instead of gold with whatever, a ruby, grab that. Uh, rock crystal is used for other things, which we'll talk about in a second. So one interesting ring that we do have uh, from the mighty Birka in Sweden is uh, a ring with a Kufic inscription that simply reads Allah, which gives you an idea of how far some of these pieces of jewellery were, were traded and moved around. Um, something that has come from, you know, potentially uh, the Arabian Peninsula, North Africa or Spain, ends up right up northeast in Sweden, which is fantastic. But one place where there's a lot of crossover is between rings and arm rings and Arm rings or armlets are generally made of silver in the Viking Age because they're not only jewellery, they're also used as currency. So you'll see an arm ring made of silver, just like this one that is decorated, stamped, that has just been cut in half. Because, smiley face, it's a, it's a Salvador Dali moustache. I must take my... Where was he from? I must take my, my porcupine for a walk immediately. And paint a melting clock. Um, so the, And this is what we call hack silver. You've probably heard the term hack silver if you're into the Vikings before. You probably know what hack silver is. It's literally silver that's been hacked up and used as currency. Um, so silver, as long as it's silver, is, is perfectly legal to use as, as currency in the Viking Age in many places. And a lot of the rings that we find made of silver, if they're made of kind of a flat, broad piece of metal rather than a, a round uh, band wire, will have stamped decoration on them, like this. So you will see, for example, an arm ring with this kind of very popular sort of double triangle Sands of Time-esque detail stamped in it, and you'll then see a ring with exactly the same kind of detail stamped on it. Which is interesting, and one of the things that tells us is that jewellers, silversmiths, um, 
were making different types of accessories and jewellery for people. So they could make rings, they could make you an arm ring, they could probably make you a torque or a Thor's hammer pendant. So we have professional silversmiths making things with specialised stamps and tools. Uh, and it's easy to forget that the Norse, the Scandinavians, the Vikings, whatever you want to call them, didn't just appear in AD 793. They were around for a very long time, and they're part of an old culture with practices and traditions and skills and crafts uh, that are being practiced all over Europe. So these, are, these people are professionals. They're good at what they do. There's this idea in modern times that the Norse and the Scandinavians were barbarians and they were brutal. A lot of that comes from later Christian writing about them. So we've got rings down to a pretty fine art. What should you be looking for when you buy these things online? Look at the material. Um, if they're made of brass, they're going to tarnish. If your arm ring is pewter, not silver, it's going to go a slightly different colour. Uh, if your ring is gold plated, the gold plating will wear off with wear. Uh, if it's silver plated over bronze, the silver plating will come off with wear. So just be aware that things will change as you wear them. As with the brooches, see if you can find something that is actually based on a find. So what I would say is don't try and make the evidence fit your jewellery. Try and get jewellery that represents the evidence. Okay, so we're talking about living history here, reenactment. We're trying to use the evidence we have available to build an impression of a person in the past to as accurate and as realistic and authentic a degree as we can. So just see what you can find that A, looks good, comes in sizes that you can wear, uh, and is made of the right stuff and looks right. Okay, let's into arm rings is going to lead us into a slightly bigger segue. Arm rings are a really popular piece of jewellery in kind of neo-viking or viking-inspired jewellery shops um, and general shops. You know the ones I mean. And they did come in a bewildering array. There were loads of different types of arm rings being worn in the Viking Age. To take a look at that and, and get an idea, you, you just have to go on any national museum website in Northern Europe and you will see, if you type in Viking arm ring, or even just arm ring, a ton of different styles. There are things like this from the National Museum of Wales that are beautifully decorated and stamped. Um, there are examples like this from the British Museum that's just basically a silver ingot that's been hammered out a bit longer. Uh, there are cast ones. There are ones that have been hammered into shape. There are ones made of intertwining strands of silver. There are gold ones. So there is a huge variety, and it does kind of depend where you want to be from. If you want to be Hiberno-Norse, you might choose a slightly different style to a Danish Viking. If you want to be Anglo-Scandinavian, you might choose a different style to a Swede. So just check out the national museums of the country where your kind of impression is based around. I've got a big mix of different types because I have different areas that I like to be from because I go to events all over Britain. Sort of a good guide is you want something that is not wafer thin. These things weren't wafer thin. They were, you know, cuttable with a knife or snappable, but a couple of mil some of them are. Um, you want something that is silver or looks like silver or gold and stamped decoration is probably a safe bet wherever you're from. Stuff like this. A nice, simple, stamped decoration. Uh, triangles are popular. Uh, the classic ring and dot is sometimes popular. Uh, things like just, just sort of punched circles, wedges, almost like cuneiform, uh, and lines, hashed lines, sometimes are quite popular as well. So go for something relatively safe if you're not confident or if you're new to the scene, uh, and if you've got the cash to splash, you know, go for a replica or something like this in solid silver. Why not? Okay, so moving up again, we're going to go to neck rings, also called torques, uh, and you can spell that in a couple of ways. Be careful with using the word torque, because often a torque refers to the thick, chunky, what they call donut torques that were worn by uh, a variety of Celtic peoples uh, and to a lesser extent by the Romans in the army. We're not looking for them in the Viking Age. What we're looking for in the Viking Age is basically a bigger version of uh, the arm rings or the bracelets. And we've got finds of these from all over Viking Age Scandinavia and Northern Europe. Um, 
In Sweden, we tend to see the plaited variety with uh, a solid end and a bit of a hook clasp. Uh, in Norway, we have a lot of gold examples, some plaited, uh, some twisted to look like they're plaited with flat terminals with stamped decoration on them. Um, in Denmark, again, gold ones, plaited ones. Um, do we have any unplatted ones? I think we've got gold arm rings and bracelets from Denmark. I'm. It's escaping me as to whether we have any sort of pseudo plaited, twisted neck rings from Denmark. If anybody can give me a fine spot for one in the comments, that would be appreciated. We have we have several from Britain. A lot of plaited ones, twisted ones. Uh, we've got them in silver mainly, I believe, and they come from a variety of places. We've got a couple from Scotland. Uh, there's one from the Kewadale Horde, there's one from the Vale of York Horde, uh, and some of these are kind of lumped in with uh, twisted gold bracelets, rings, ingots of silver, and hoards generally are a good place to look for styles of these things. So if you go to the British Museum, you'll be able to look at a hoard of silver from the Viking Age, you can see several types of arm ring in there, neck rings, uh, silver rings for your finger, coins, ingots and bars, hack silver, and you can see the cross section of all of these bars, you can see that some of them are flat plates, some of them are rounded, some of them are diamond or square profile, and some of them are kind of somewhere in between. So you can see all the different styles. One interesting style that we see, and generally in Sweden is where you get, I think, more of these, but I believe there's an example from Ireland, is a type that is a, a sort of solid bar of metal. I think we've got a couple of different ones. I think we've got some bronze ones and some silver ones with a pendant on it, either hanging from a ring around. So, you, <laughs> so you've got the neck ring and then you've got another smaller ring on it that suspends a Thor's hammer. And we also have an example that has just the Thor's hammer without a suspension ring. Uh, so that is a type of neck ring. So when you see this online, a torque with a Thor's hammer on it, yes, that is a thing that was worn. Um, but the examples that we have tend to be very plain, where it'll just be a very thin band of metal. Uh, I think a couple might even be iron, and you'll then have the Thor's hammer on it. So these are not big, chunky, gold and silver things with a massive Thor's hammer. No, no, they're very subtle pieces of jewellery just with a hammer on it. Uh, why are they made like that? possibly because uh, there was no facility to make chains in the area where these were being made, and just a, a simple band of metal was easier for the local smith to make. Difficult to know. If you have any ideas on that, let me know in the comments. Moving slightly sideways, kind of down a little bit from neck rings, uh, we're going to look at pendants. So one of the most obvious types of pendant is going to be the Thor's hammer. In fact, I've, I've got a Thor's hammer pendant just behind me there. That one, right on the tip of my finger, is based from... It's based on a find from Denmark, uh, and editing Jimmy is going to pop the find spot on the screen, because I can't remember it, but mine is right there. These were worn by men and women, as far as we can tell. Um, gendering jewellery is particularly difficult for the Viking Age, uh, because there is a, a mix of all of these types that we've mentioned from the graves of a variety of people. Uh, and some of these are loose finds and hoard finds, and it's quite difficult um, and relatively rare to see a Thor's hammer on a dig, even a Viking Age dig. So we do have a variety of these. Uh, there are some that are very simple, there are some that are highly decorated, some that are quite chunky, uh, some that are worn suspended from probably organic material like a leather thong, some that have been found suspended from beautifully woven silver wire chains, uh, which is another thing that deserves its own video, really. Uh, and these come in a variety of, with a variety of names, like Viking Knit, Trichinopoly, take your pick, you'll find something about it. Um, they come in a variety of materials, bronze, iron, silver, amber. We have a couple of amber ones. Um, I think in Birka there's a, a woman's grave that has an amber Thor's hammer in it, if I remember correctly. Some of them are kind of flathead hammers, some of them are flathead hammers with a bit of a point at the end, some of them are sort of that chevron shape of hammer. They were, they were, they were made in all kinds 
of ways and in all shapes and sizes. Well, not in all shapes and sizes. They're generally two to three centimeters long, which is kind of sort of the length of my thumb at their biggest. They weren't big. Um, they seem to have been quite subtle little things. Okay, you can wear them on a big silver chain, but the hammer themselves, the hammer itself, tends to be quite small. Some of them have faces on them, some of them have uh, not work and interlace, some of them have stamped designs. Mine has a stamped design. In fact, we've got several from Denmark and Iceland that have stamped designs on them. Some we think come from the same workshop, which is exciting. Uh, and these are found all over the place, found in England, found in Ireland, found in Iceland, Denmark, Sweden. You name it, if the Vikings went there, they were probably wearing a Thor's hammer before they all converted to Christianity. That's about it for Thor's hammers. And again, the variety out there is bewildering, but be careful when you're buying online, because the main thing that goes wrong for Thor's hammers when you buy them online is the chain that they're suspended from is often fictional. We do have silver chains made of interwoven wire with animal heads used to suspend the pendant from. They're relatively rare and they're made in a fairly specific way, but some people will try and sell you chunky rubbish. So be careful. Don't buy chunky rubbish. Buy good stuff if you can. We do have amazing finds of things that kind of defy classification, like this guy from the Vale of York Hoard. It's clearly a metal bead with filigree silver wire work, which is another amazing thing that they were doing in the Viking Age, which just blows my mind. Filigree work has always blown my mind. I think it's fantastic. If anybody wants to make me a filigree work bead, please do. And it's attached by chain to the pin, the hinged pin. You can see we have an, a small fixing pin through here to form a hinge of a brooch. The brooch is now missing. Bugger, because that would be an amazing thing to have a full replica of. This this obvious suspended bead. It's a bead, almost like a chatelaine, suspended from a brooch. Fantastic. Um, and I would love to see what kind of brooch that was. You know, presumably at this point, penannular. Um, but we have these amazing things. We have these silver wirework, whatever you want to call them, mounts. Some people call them buttons, but I don't think they are buttons. I think they're mounts. Um, we do have buttons from the Viking Age, but that's going to go into a closures video at some point for clothing closures, because I need lots and lots of time to explain that one. Yes, we have Viking Age axe head pendants. No, they're not like this. The ones we have tend to be small, very subtle, and several are actually carved from amber. So, no, fine if you're going to an Amon Amath concert. Yes, if you're a, well, specifically Northern or Northeastern European, because it's made of amber, and that's where most of the amber came from in the period. <laughs> Funny that. Coin pendants are worn into the Viking Age. We have something called a Bracteate pendant, which is um, a gold coin pendant. We also have silver coin pendants. And then pendants that are made to look like it's a coin that's not a coin. Uh, so it's a coin effect pendant, if you like. These seem to fall out of favour to a degree through the Viking Age, uh, and then kind of come back into popularity a little bit as a little bit later on. Um, so you know, be careful if you're going to buy one of those. Make sure that it, it looks right and it is appropriate for the time and the place you're trying to reenact. Uh, ladies tend to be wearing strings of beads, so we're going to look at that in more detail in the beads video. But yeah, a string of nice glass, amber, bone, even wood and polished stone beads. Rock crystal is quite popular as well for making beads. The rock crystal in the silver mount that you see in a lot of Viking trade fairs, yeah, they were wearing those. Um, we have some from Gotland and... Uh, these are rock crystal, polished to a very high quality, mounted in silver. They're, they're, that, that's what they look like. They look like that. Uh, the only issue with these is they're 11th, 12th century. Um, now we know the Anglo-Saxons were making things out of rock crystal, the Carolingians were making things out of rock crystal. So rock crystal carving, sometimes fantastically detailed rock crystal carving, is a European tradition and a Northern European tradition. Um, these These... But these, these rock crystals from Gotland, they're called the Visby lenses, because several of them are now in the museum in Visby. They are 
quite rare. They're very high quality, and they're um, <clears throat> they're not big. <laughs> the best example is two inches across, so you know, about that big. Uh, so they're not massive. That's like that, and they are possibly used for fine metalworking or jewellery work, like as mag kind of as magnifying glasses. We don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. Um, seem to work as aspheric lenses, or aspheric lenses, but holding my hands up and saying, we don't know. So what else in pendants do we need to cover? And Thor's hammers. Valkyrie pendants are worn, but be aware that these are almost always cast from earlier ones. Uh, and when I say earlier, some of these pendant designs are recasts of 6th century and 7th century designs. Um, so be aware that they're they're possibly not accurate depictions of women's clothing in the period, but they are known. They are known from the period. They were making Christian cross pendants. We actually have a fantastic mould that is on one side a Thor's hammer and on the other side a cross. So we've got fantastic evidence that sort of people making jewellery for everybody. So far from this, pagans hated Christians, hated pagans, hated Christians, hated Muslims. People were just, jewellers were like, ah, I've got some Christians in town. Brilliant, they might want jewellery. Pours silver on both sides of mould. Beautiful. Um, we've also got a, a cross pendant with a dog's head on the end, which is fantastic. Now, yeah, there there's really is a bewildering array of pendants out there. So again, same as the advice for the rings, with the arm rings, with the neck rings. Just be careful. Do a bit of research. And like I said in the brooches video, the research should be part of the hobby. It should be a part of the hobby that you do a bit of reading, you know, buy a couple of second-hand books on the subject, go to a museum if you can afford to get out of town, and, you know, the restrictions are, are all done within your in, in your local area. So yeah, that's mostly pendants. The one type of pendant I absolutely do not want to see you wear on my living history display is a f***ing boar's tusk. Don't wear a boar's tusk pendant. Viking men didn't wear boar's tusk pendants, for goodness sake. So there's no evidence at all for boar's tusk pendants in Viking Age Scandinavia. No, there isn't. No, there isn't. What we have are tooth pendants associated with girls, children. There's a bear tooth uh, associated with a little girl from a grave uh, in Birka. In Sweden, uh, we have a single bear's tooth from a house in England, not associated with a grave, uh, and has no associated burial at all. There's no evidence of horse teeth. Have you seen horses' teeth? I have. They don't look good and they don't taste nice. Um, dog's teeth, again, associated with children. Beaver's teeth, Anglo Saxon women, pre, -Christian pre Christianity. Boar's tusk? We have a boar's tusk in the grave of a man from Anglo-Saxon England, and it's definitely not a pendant. This is definitely not a pendant. That's not where you wear pendants. It's meant to be his penis. So there we go. That's mostly what I wanted to talk about. As far as we know, Viking women didn't wear earrings, by the way. Uh, earrings are a thing that we, we don't really have any evidence for, being worn by Viking Age women. Slavic women? seem to have worn earrings and temple rings that are kind of suspended here uh, with either bands of cloth or weaving, which they're really pretty, they're really attractive, and I think they're still a part of some Eastern European folk clothing traditions. Please do let me know in the comments if that's true. I think that that's right. Um, I want to say Estonia, maybe, it's still a part of some, some of the folk traditions over there, which is really cool. Um, men, as far as we can tell, didn't wear beard rings because that's just modern <laughs> and didn't really exist as a concept uh, before Hollywood. So yeah, uh, if you want to wear Viking jewellery, um, get a nice ring, get a nice pendant, get a couple of arm rings, get a neck ring, uh, and that's probably more than enough metal to weigh you down for a, your average day on a Viking reenactment. Thank you ever so much, so much for joining me, and uh, I'm amazed that so many of you guys have joined the Patreon when I took a week off doing a video, so maybe I should take a week off more often. Thank you ever so much for your patience, by the way. Uh, I, had a, I had a very busy couple of weeks. Lots of PhD work to be done, and I know a lot of you guys are, are kind of 
um, keeping up with my progress. I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm feeling much better and uh, COVID is, is definitely leaving my body. Um, so thank you ever so much to everyone who's been sending me lovely letters and messages and oh, fantastic. Look, this is Tunic. Tunic. Uh, it's from the channel trailer. So thank you so much to everybody who's been sending me get well stuff. Um, thank you especially to everyone who sent me tea, which I am delicately moseying my way through. This is this is second breakfast from Tabletop Teas, and uh, it's really very nice. If you're in North America, get some. Uh, get some. So yeah, deal come out And of course, until the next time, who will I'm a troll?